Well, good afternoon slash evening slash morning, everybody, from wherever you're watching, whether it's live or maybe catching the recording later. Uh, my name is Aaron Standard, and I'm here with uh, my teammate from Petterbridge, Gregorius Sudharmo. And today Hello. we're going to go ahead and do something a little different than our normal monthly Akadonet community stand-up. Akadonet just turned 10 years old uh, the past, uh, let's say, a few weeks ago. And I wanted to go ahead and put together a little retrospective that we're going to do live uh, on the stream today to kind of talk a bit about some of the things that have changed over the course of Akadonet over that period of time, a little bit about where it came from, a little bit about where it's going, and honestly, what it kind of takes to sustain a project for a decade. So we're going to talk a bit about that. I'm going to go ahead and hide <laughs> Gregorius and I's mugs from the screen here, and we'll go ahead and just jump right in. So the origins of Akadonet, where did where did this whole project come from originally? Um, well, from my point of view, I had quit my job at Microsoft in 2012 to found an analytics company called Marked Up uh, Analytics. We did real-time marketing automation and analytics for developers that are building apps for the Windows 8 store, Windows Phone, and then later uh, we also added Win32 desktop support. We were having some, our analytics product was heavily used in, in market already, but it was never going to generate a huge amount of money just because there was a lot of free alternatives in market like Google Analytics. So we decided that in order to differentiate ourselves, we needed to go ahead and come up with a way to make sure that um, we could provide value that our own customers would actually pay for. And that's where we got the idea to go ahead and do marketing automation where we would go ahead and have our existing customers that had integrated our analytics SDK into their Win32 desktop application could also distribute our notification client, which is designed to run on the Windows system tray. So kind of like how you'll see offers from Microsoft to you know buy Office 365 or upgrade your OneDrive account, show up in the Windows tray down to the right. We basically built a programmable system to allow any software developer to go ahead and show their own branded messages there back on Windows 8, uh, Windows Vista, Windows 7, all that sort of stuff. So the way this would work is that the Analytics SDK would gather data from all from every individual user connected to the system, and all of those events would be streamed to our existing analytics service that was already been live and had been running uh, for years. Uh, we would allow users to take those same analytic events and use them to create personalized one-to-one -one uh, marketing campaigns that would send an initial notification immediately and then drip other messages out over a period of time, all with the goal of trying to prompt the user to complete some marketing objective, usually buying something. Um, and so that was kind of the idea behind this product. Now, one of the things that was interesting about this product was that from day one, it was going to have a immensely crushingly high traffic. The Marked up analytics SDK was already installed into at least 30 million active devices per month. Uh, we processed 500 megabytes of event data per second coming in through our load balancer. So this is not like files or anything that's big. These were all pretty compressed JSON payloads being sent through our load balancer. So at like peak volume, we would do as high as 10,000 events per second uh, during uh, during like the sort of peak window during the uh, evenings in the United States, typically. And this resulted in about 100 million, and I say database transactions per day, I mean writes to the database per day. And this number was always growing. So we knew that from the very moment the system went live, it was going to be subjected to all of this force and then all the internal forces we needed to try to make this marketing automation system run, plus the new message delivery system we would need to communicate with all these clients would also be something that those clients would periodically connect to. So this was going to be a big, high-traffic distributed system from the very beginning. So this is like 2014, or sorry, late late 2013 timeframe. Um, now, the thing that we tried to do to go ahead and build this, this sort of event-driven system, is the previous marked up analytics componentry had been built on top of basically a CRUD architecture that used ASP.NET MVC running on Amazon Web Services with a big Apache Cassandra cluster behind it. All of our actual real-time analytics was powered by a couple of Cassandra-specific data structures called distributed counters. So for this type of, of work we were doing, this was, we tried to originally kind of model it the same way, 
but it was a much more event-driven type flow. So you can kind of imagine this is the same structure that our analytic system used. We designed it so, you know, uh, for this marketing campaign, this user needed to produce these four events. The order didn't necessarily matter. We just needed to know that all four of them had been achieved by this user. So we implemented a really common stateless strategy for doing this called read after write, where you go and fire your event, you write it into a little log for that user, and then you try to read all of the content in that log back. And the idea being that when the final event is written and you read everything in the log back, you now have all the data you need to go ahead and know that this user has successfully completed their work. And we can use that to trigger the notification being sent to the customer. Um, we were very proficient at load testing and integration testing marked up software. And we tried testing this prototype with, let's say, like 100, you know, 100 or 1,000 users with like 10 events each somewhere in there. And we noticed that this triggered fewer than like one, basically less than 1% of all users got the campaign under this design. And it's for a really simple reason, which is that even though I can make Cassandra, I can it has tunable consistency, so I can make it work the, kind of similarly to, um, with a similar level of consistency to something like a SQL Server with replication. Um, even with that turned on, that didn't solve the problem because you can't use the database to control application level concurrency up here. It can only manage its own internal data storage and consistency concurrency, not the ability for each of these application servers to know when their work is done. So when we would do these reads and writes, it was very common for us to go ahead and do a read where, where another event was still being written. And as a result, uh, no one ever completed the state machine. So we realized that this was fundamentally a stateful programming problem. Um, now, I had not had any real distributed systems experience before working at Marked Up. I had worked at Microsoft prior to that, but I was an evangelist. I was primarily responsible for helping advertise software products and get developers to adopt them, namely Windows Phone and Windows Azure. But when I we got into the guts of, of building Marked Up itself, uh, we got a lot of experience on how to manage traffic and scalability and so forth. But this was a totally different animal. We realized that making the database the source of the truth here and trying to crud our way to it was ultimately not going to work. The other reason why it wasn't going to work is these notifications had to be super low latency in order for them to be effective. The difference between receiving that first notification right as the user was doing something inside the application versus getting it 60 seconds later was like 40%. Um, so that's a massive, uh, let's say, difference in value proposition, being able to do that. So trying to use something like scheduled or time jobs to go ahead and do all that batch processing wasn't going to work. And that system would never be able to keep up with the level of traffic we had either. So stateful programming was the only realistic solution to the problem here. Where what we had to do was guarantee that all events for the same user in the same campaign all had to be coalesced physically together inside the same server, inside the same unit of work. Otherwise, the system would be too expensive and it would be too inconsistent to work reliably. So we discovered after doing a bit of Googling, once we realized, once we needed state here, that there was actually, in fact, an entire programming model built around this called the actor model. And there was a very popular implementation of it on Scala and Java called Akka. And so I kind of learned a bit about the actor model. I had a chance to take a look at it. And I also decided, you know, basically maybe we should see if something like this exists in .NET. So as I did my research, you know, I discovered that in 1973, the actor model white paper was published. That means that the actor model is only two years younger than the relational database in terms of, let's say, how old the, the genesis of the idea is. So that makes it pretty venerable in software programming terms. And then in 1986, you know, I was born in 1985. So this means when I was still in diapers, there were people using the actor model in production successfully already. Uh, this is when Erlang was, was created and was first used by Ericsson to build digital telephony exchanges. So I figured, okay, um, there's a re gotta be a reasonably good chance here in the year 2013, this 40 year old technology has been implemented somewhere by someone inside the Donna ecosystem. Well. The reason why we're all here is because that extremely reasonable assumption was profoundly wrong. The state of the .NET ecosystem 
was comically bad in 2013. And in 2014, I published a blog post called The Profound Weakness of the .NET Open Source Ecosystem. Um, I'm going to be brutally honest here. Most of the open source projects that were being implemented in .NET back then dealt with extremely trivial crap for the most part. We're talking things like, no offense, MVVM frameworks and dependency injection containers and stuff like that. Not any serious computer science, like hard engineering problems. There wasn't even a socket server written in .NET back then that was publicly available. There were some commercial libraries you could buy, but I wasn't about to spend months evaluating those. I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go ahead and write something that does all the eventing myself. And that's it. Um, so we implemented it with a span of six months. So this is from like November 20, 2013. We implemented Helios, our socket server that powered the first versions of Remote. We implemented the first versions of Akka.net, which had the core library plus remoting. And we actually also delivered our entire product. The rest of my career, I don't think I'll ever be as productive as this because that's what happens when your back is up against the wall and you can only focus on one thing and you have a small software organization and not a lot of layers of bureaucracy to go through. It was an amazing amount of output in a very short period of time, but we didn't do it alone. There were two other developers in the uh, marked up team working on aspects of this too. Plus the Akadana open source project was born from this as well. And I'm going to spend some more time talking a bit about that. So the framing I want to have for this talk about as, as far as like the 10 year history of Akka.net points to this diagram that you've probably seen before the cycle of change where you begin in this sort of stage of uninformed optimism. I might even call this uninformed enthusiasm up here as well, where you think everything's great. It's a kind of a free floating, lots of ideas going around a sort of stage. And then as you start digging into the details of it, you realize how hard things are. And then when you get to the Valley of Despair down here, you're like, you're thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna, I've got to quit. This is impossible. It's not going to work. And if you stick with it long enough, you eventually start pulling the nose cone back up and you gain altitude again. And you get back to informed optimism and success and fulfillment. I, I got to say, parenting feels like this <laughs> as well. Uh, starting a business feels like this. Uh, doing anything challenging or anything that's pretty transformational feels like this and open source projects are no different. So with this framing in mind, let's go ahead and talk a bit about how things have happened over the past 10 years with Aka.net. So we begin in 2013, that's where our, our journey begins, uninformed optimism. In on November 23rd, I think we're maybe 21st, 2013, this is the first commit I have. In fact, let me go and pull this over here. The first commit I have in the Helios library, November 21st, 2013. This is the point at which I had decided that trying to write our backend in Java to go ahead and use the original Akka library was probably not going to be feasible. Namely that from a risk management point of view, our team had a ton of .NET experience and no experience writing Java apps. And we knew we were going to be nailed with super high traffic from day one. And we simply just could not afford a failure on the launch pad. So we decided that porting Akka to .NET was the, versus porting parts of our infrastructure to Java and running it that way was the lesser of two evils. So that's sort of the decision-making that, that played in there. I also wrote uh, a library called Hyperion. It was, I never publicly open-sourced it. It was always in a private repo in our organization, and I don't have a copy of it anymore. But it was a TPL.dataflow-based implementation of Akka.net. So I used things like the buffering mailbox, the buffering boxes and all that stuff to try to go ahead and construct all the Akka primitives uh, using uh, the task and parallelizing libraries data flow. Uh, Roger Johansson, the other sort of founder of the Akka.net project, he just, this is just a, a sort of a miraculous coincidence, started working on a port of Akka to .NET at the exact same time we were, and he created the original repository that we now know as the Akka.net project. Um, so his prototype was called Pigeon, and I don't remember how I found it. But basically around, and I documented this in a blog post on the Pettibridge website called uh, Akka.net one year later, um, around early February 2014, I think I had had a chance to do a comparative benchmark between my TPL implementation and his, and the performance on his implementation d demolished mine. It was way more performant. He'd also gotten a lot further with implementing <clears throat> some other Akka constructs, like I think 
dealing with restarts was something he had he had figured out yet that I hadn't even attempted to work on. So I thought, you know, <clears throat> I sent him an email saying that, you know, we should join forces and I'll come contribute to your implementation because I think your implementation has better fundamentals than mine does. And so we, we joined forces then. And by early March of 2014, Roger got permission from, they were called TypeSafe at the time, they're Lightbend now. These are the original creators of Akka. He got permission from them to call our project the Akka.net project. So we kind of rebranded the repository from Pigeon uh, and we changed you know, the, the names of the NuGet packages and the namespaces and all that stuff. And then the first live NuGet package published under the Akka.net name came out maybe uh, a week or two later. Uh, so March 19th, this is the first version we ever published in NuGet. And one really important detail about this release is we had the first cut of an F-sharp API in here as well. The F-sharp community, I think, played the most important early role in the success of Akka.net because... The actor model and some of these other like concurrent stateful programming paradigms, there were really only two groups of people who appreciated that in the Dada ecosystem. One was kind of like the reactive extensions community, which was small and niche. The F-sharp com community was also small and niche, but the difference is they had a really effective platform for reaching people and teaching these concepts. They kind of had a better evangelistic structure than the reactive extensions people did. So a lot of early contributors who helped write some of the features for Akka.net and even rewrote our build system. Uh, I originally wrote it in Ruby and someone came along and rewrote it in fake and we've been using that ever since. They all kind of got on board around this time. I think Don Syme even promoted us back then. He's the creator of F Sharp. But this was really pivotal in kind of attracting some really early interest in the platform, was adding this F-sharp support and trying to attract F-sharp users to it, who kind of, through the built-in F-sharp agents constructs that are in the uh, core library of F-sharp, there was already kind of some pre-built knowledge and experience working with actor-like functionality in the ecosystem. So that helped a lot. And then by uh, sort of early April of 2014, we got the Aka, the first release that had Akka.remote and stashing and pipe doing it. This is the release of Akka.net that Marked Up needed in order to deliver its software. Um, so we were able to launch the first version of our Marked Up automation system probably maybe <clears throat> a month or so after this came out. We had been using the nightlies and the little betas we were working on uh, to kind of work on our product while this was still being fine-tuned. But we were able to release to market, I think, by late May or early June of 2016. And then on uh, October 16th, 2014, uh, we did our 0 0.7 release, which is the first version of Akadot Cluster. Our logging system kind of got introduced. And I was, you know, very, I, I personally worked a lot on remoting and clustering because these were the things I cared about for our software. So <clears throat> during this time period, there were a lot of new contributors, new users showing up. Lots of people with, who were attracted to the, the promise of the project and the ideas. And so there was also a lot of work kind of feverishly porting things over from the Scala version of Akka to the C-sharp and F-sharp version of it. And 2015, this continued. Uh, Marked Up died basically around, around a year after I started working on the Akka port. Um, there are, that's a subject for a separate talk, but the long and the short of it is the Windows Store and the Windows Desktop Marketplace were just not good markets to try to build that type of product. We probably would have been a lot better off if we had targeted like websites instead. So lesson learned there, a story for a different talk some other time. But in January 5th, 2015, about six weeks after Marked Up died, I, I went ahead and I, I had been contacted after I published our blog post about um, shutting Marked Up down by a number of people who were using Akka.net in production. So I got some messages on LinkedIn and a couple other places. And I decided to pitch to uh, Andrew, who I co-founded uh, Petabridge with, pitch to him the idea of forming an entity around trying to professionalize like services and support on top of Akka.net. And uh, we got the blessing of Roger and the other members of the um, uh, Akka.net project at the time, went ahead and we started the company. And then we got to work trying to go ahead and ship more new features. Our new mission, as soon as we founded Petabridge, was to get Akka.net out of beta and to start trying to attract the production users who would eventually become our customers. So uh, we started working on getting some modules like the dependency injection system, Akka.net persistence. So Bartosz was kind of the primary driver behind this. Um, if, you know, Bartosz Szapowski, who was one of the contributors who worked on Akka.net for years and years, 
He drove a lot of that effort here. The multi-node test runner for trying to test clustering came out. And then the other thing that came out around this time was the very first part of Akka.net Bootcamp. Bootcamp was a really significant thing that rapidly grew the adoption of Akka.net because it gave people a kinesthetic way of learning the actor model, the syntax, and also the way programs are constructed using actors. Um, just like how the F sharp, the, if it weren't for the F sharp community adopting Akka.net and evangelizing it, I would have never been contacted by people about adopting it uh, and basically helping them with it at their own companies. So Petabridge wouldn't have existed. And without Akka.net bootcamp, Akka.net wouldn't have been this big force in the .NET ecosystem that it eventually became. This was really responsible for a lot of the rapid growth in users. That's why, you know, uh, other technologies in the .NET ecosystem like RavenDB and Protoactor have kind of also followed suit with this. This strategy is very successful and works for trying to go ahead and grow an ecosystem around an open source project. Um, in April 2015, we shipped Akka.net 1.0, where we basically had finalized versions of things like the F Sharp API, the actor reference design, the test kit, the dispatching system, consistent hash routers. We also actually added mono support to our build system then. And we had the first versions of Akka Persistence that were all targeted at SQL Server. These were all things we knew we needed in order to try to start attracting production users. Um, one funny thing I'll circle back on is the reentrant async actors. This ended up royally biting us in the ass later, um, but I'll get to that towards the end of today's presentation. Then we started, you know, as after that we rang the bell, we did kind of a big press launch after uh, Akadonet 1.0 ship. So I appeared at a couple at .NET Fringe and on a number of podcasts like with Scott Hanselman and. Um, .NET rocks. Let everyone know the Akka.NET 1.0 was ready for production. And we had a giant surge in, let's say, just active users, installs, a lot of people going through boot camp, a lot of people signing up for the Petabridge mailing list. So this really started accelerating the rate at which we attracted production users quite a bit. And boot camp kind of helped provide the infrastructure for getting people onboarded onto it. So what started happening after 2015 is we began learning that there's certain procedures and standards we need to have in place in order to keep production users happy. Now, Petabridge had a very vested interest in making sure that production users want, felt trusted and wanted to keep adopting Akka.net. And that basically came down to we needed to make sure that we didn't introduce any sudden or violent breaking changes. We needed to make sure that things were secure. We needed to make sure that we were responsive when issues came up. And we needed to go ahead and basically do active bug triage and that, that type of stuff as well. So <clears throat> we started shipping some additional features, cluster sharding, cluster tools. Um, but then the next really big engineering effort, this is where things kind of started to, it became less about porting new features at this point and a lot more about taking the features that did exist and trying to harden them enough so users could rely on them in production. That's one of the things that changes on this adoption curve is the creative you know, ideation and spinning up new modules. And in the case of Akka.net, porting new code, there became less of that work and more of the kind of disciplined, narrow focus work on fixing bugs, uh, adding, being able to reproduce things reliably, trying to measure performance, all this sort of stuff is kind of what became the focus. So I exhausted myself. I remember working on this uh, stable release of clustering. That was kind of the thing I, I focused on. We also replaced Akadot Remote's transport the first time because the first version of Helios had all sorts of, in my opinion, <clears throat> embarrassing design problems in hindsight. But I didn't know any better when I wrote it the first time. <clears throat> we had a number of contributors, like actually Gregorius, who's here on the call, and uh, Mark Pichura and Chris Constantin, who ported Aka Streams. That's a that was a monumental piece of work that they all did. And then uh, I also uh, rewrote the entire mailbox and system messaging protocol, which is a pretty heavy lift. That I'll get into some more detail later. Um, so we're kind of at the stage now where things are starting to get a little bit more locked down on the project. We're starting to require a lot more testing. We're starting to require things be documented more thoroughly than they were before. And we're also starting to we're starting to develop the the muscle around performance testing here. By 2017, you know, we did this 1.2 release where basically we swapped out Helios with .NETI at this point. .NETI was, uh, is still the, the library we use for Akadot Remote today. That was a professional port that Microsoft's uh, IoT group ran for, for Azure. 
uh, to bring the Netty library, which is like the stand, gold standard socket server library for Java, to bring that over to .NET. That project has since been abandoned, so we're going to have to replace our transportation system again. I'll touch on that a little later. And we got Aka Streams out of beta as well. So we kind of froze the APIs here, took care of that. Um, as production use of Aka.net started increasing, I started doing a lot more things with Petabridge, like architecture reviews, where I'd actually go and take a look at production user code. I saw that numerous customers had begun writing their own command lines for trying to manage Aka.cluster specifically. And I decided that, you know, if, I've see, if I'm seeing three users all writing tools or trying to manage Akid on its infrastructure, that probably means this is a problem we should be solving. So we released the first version of Petabridge.command, which is designed to do that uh, right around uh, 2017. Uh, we never open sourced Petabridge.command because we had plans to uh, maybe <clears throat> add commercial add-ons for things like doing a single sign-on with Active Directory. We never got around to doing that. So I, it's always been a free library, but I kind of wonder if it makes sense for us at some point in the future to open source this. Don't have any plans to do that at the time, but that's that was kind of the original intent, uh, but we've never kind of circled back on it. We've just made it a free thing that's been available out there. Um, the other big thing that happened during this period is .NET Core 1.0 shipped in June of 2017. Um, it is very difficult to describe for anyone who wasn't a part of that how transformative that was for the ecosystem from everything from the way your uh, XML files and Visual Studio changed, your build tooling changed. There were a lot of breakages while this was happening too, even among stable versions of the .NET Core tooling. There was a lot of disruption happening all at once and it took a couple of years for that to work itself out. By the time .NET Core 3.1 shipped, I think things were pretty steady after that. But um, we decided to go ahead and very rapidly add support for .NET Core. So we shipped Aka.NET 1.3, which did dual targeting between .NET Standard and, uh, and .NET Framework 4.5, which we were still supporting at the time. And then we also uh, got Aka.Persistence out of beta, finally. So this was going to create a lot of work uh, for us over the next couple of years. Um, after we shipped Aka.NET 1.3 and as .NET Core sort of taking off, there were a lot more opportunities inside big organizations, the type that would need a really high performance, highly scalable tool like Aka.NET. There were a lot more opportunities to say, hey, while we're looking at maybe evaluating ASP.NET Core, which requires us to go ahead and shift a ton of our business practices and development processes anyway, why don't we also take a look at Aka.net since we've identified that this might be able to help us solve these business problems. So we had a big surge again in production users. Our rate of installations was basically doubling every year from about 2014 until I think 2021. I think our rate, our, total, our cumulative rate of installs was doubling. You can't sustain that forever, but we still go and grow our install base by like 40 or 50% a year now. So it's that rate of growth has not slowed down at all this whole time. But as a result of that, we got a, a lot more bug reports, a lot more performance issues reported. So there was a lot of open source work to do. And a lot of this was sort of deep in the weeds, thankless, highly detail oriented bugs. But on top of that, there were also some alignment issues with Petabridge that started showing up. We can go ahead and spend, you know, thousands of man hours investigating bugs and trying to do better documentation and trying to add new features and fix performance issues. But none of that would necessarily translate to improving our bottom line. I was having to do a lot of consulting and training and other types of things while this was all going on. And... That alignment issue meant that, uh, and this is by the way, this alignment issue between Petabridge and Aka.net is still like the number one business challenge uh, for our organization. So we decided to go ahead and introduce Phobos, our first paid library. This is basically uh, observability tools for Aka.net. We decided to make this available commercially in order to try to resolve some of these alignment issues. We also started really pushing support plans more around here as well. Um, Phobos absolutely cratered. Uh, like performed way worse than I could have even predicted as a commercial product. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Probably our pricing was the biggest one. But the other reason, and this is still kind of a persistent issue with Phobos even today, Phobos is a commercially successful product now, but 
part of the issue is you know, we have companies that run software that's probably worth from let's say a value point of view maybe single digit billions to tens of billions of dollars in a lot of really really large publicly traded companies and the observability tools these companies use for managing that software looks like things you'd find in a 1998 web farm uh, using power grep to go ahead and inspect iis log files or you're doing other types of sort of let's say log aggregation to figure out how well the service worked uh, and you uh, relying on a combination of that and tools like Pingdom, and that's it. They're not really using things like performance counter, or not performance counters, but let's say counters or gauges and other tools to measure the performance of the system. So there is still a fair amount of that, even with open telemetry being widely available, where companies don't really observe their software the way you'd think they should. And in my opinion, it's actually bordering on irresponsible not to do that. But that was something that we had to learn the hard way through trying to do sales and being told no. Um, so then in March 11th of 2020, uh, we finally shipped Akadon at 1.4. This was basically cleaning up all the technical debt from supporting older versions of .NET Standard and .NET Core. .NET Standard was, as anyone from the .NET platform team will tell you, kind of a giant cluster. It was a, a, a heap of competing, let's say, APIs and concerns from old versions of the .NET framework and new versions of .NET Core. And that's eventually why they stopped producing it after .NET Core 3.0 or 3.1. I think that's when .NET Standard 2.1 shipped and it's been done ever since then. Um, this was a, a big technical debt cleanup and we spent most of the late part of 2019 and the early part of 2020 kind of cleaning stuff up and getting this supported. So. This is, this was, there was a lot of work going on underneath the covers. And on top of that, cluster sharding and distributed data were both individually enormously complicated libraries. Um, Gregorius, who's on, on the call with me, can uh, tell you all about how utterly painful debugging D-data serialization was, right? It is. Yeah. It was so, quite painful. Yeah, it was very painful. Uh, and there was, a, don't worry, there's a lot more pain for us to get through here. But this is kind of the valley of despair for us. Um, so one of the other things we tried to address while we're in the valley of despair here is we came to the conclusion that Phobos' pricing and also the way it was built and the way it was distributed were all factors that were hurting it as a market offering. So we so here at Petabridge, we built the first version of SDK bin. That's not directly related to Aka.net, but it certainly affected us from a business alignment standpoint. And then we also completely restructured the internals of Phobos to use app.metrics. And we redid the pricing and licensing. Namely, we made it, we basically made it a site license that has one price regardless of how you use it, uh, rather than trying to have variable pricing, which we had before. Uh, that ended up being really successful for us. It radically changed the amount of sales of Phobos that we had. And SDK bin, despite some of the issues that we've had with it, um, was very was a huge improvement over the manual system we have for delivering product uh, and helped us actually sell a lot more of it. So that was a major win. And then what this also allowed us to do, now that we kind of had better alignment between the work we did on our open source and the commercial returns we were seeing, Phobos plus a little bit of changes we made to how we sold support plans helped with that, uh, which is another thing we did around like 2019. The combination of both of those put us back into a position where working on Akadonet helped improve our bottom line more. So as a result of that, there was this very intense focus on overcoming one really important sales objection users had to adopting Akka.net, which was the performance of the cluster sharding system. There's one issue that's still open uh, around the performance of cluster sharding overall. And it not, it's not just me who worked on this. There were a whole bunch of contributors like Zetanova and others who all made pretty big improvements here. Andrew as well, who goes by the... Uh, T011M handle in uh, in on GitHub, all made major improvements here where basically we were able to go ahead and I'm going to show the numbers in just a minute, but we were able to uh, basically most of the high performance of Akadot Remote today comes from all the changes that happened here. So that's kind of the, the, the valley of despair, the trough on that curve. The informed optimism began as a result of us learning how to take problems that were previously hard and after enough discipline and enough persistence and after enough um, being willing to kind of reinvent the wheel on how we tooled some of that and how we dealt with it from a process of standards point of view, we started being able to make hard things routine 
where it didn't become such a challenge to debug a complicated sharding problem or it didn't become such a challenge to fix a performance issue or measure it, et cetera. So the informed optimism kind of really begins in 2022. This is like the, the, the nose cone going back up again. In February 2022, we shipped Phobos 2.0, uh, which was the first version that really supported open telemetry. .NET 6 came out in, I think, November 2021. That's when Otel kind of was released to market. So we very we had to rewrite all the internals of Phobos to support this. And that was a project that uh, took, I think, about three months, but we got that done in fairly short order. And then as part of that, one of the complaints we had gotten from users about Phobos was how hard it was to configure. Um, part of what came up during the Phobos 2.0 effort was the creation of Akka hosting. We were saying, you know, we've got to find a way to get people to configure Phobos more easily so we can basically improve our renewal rate and retain those customers for longer. And I know Gregorius and I had gone back and forth. We even had kind of a failed uh, uh, Hokan rewrite in Akadonet 1.4 that we ended up having to revert. You remember that, Gregorius? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to basically make it easier to use Hokan. And I decided, what if we just papered over Hokan entirely with a statically typed interface that also tied in to the Microsoft extensions ecosystem? So that was kind of, and this was all meant to help sell Phobos. But we realized this could also be used to help make Akka.net a lot easier to work with and could solve a lot of other pain points uh, that users were frequently complaining about, like integration with ASP.net, for instance. So... The creation of Akadot hosting is honestly what kind of drove the roadmap of most of Akadot 1.5. Akadot 1.5 was tr about trying to solve developer experience problems with Akadot.net, trying to make it easier to configure, trying to make it easier to operate, trying to make it easier to deploy, trying to make it easier to observe with things like Akka Health Check. So we did deliver that kind of in March of this year. In May of this year, we delivered Akka.net 1.57, which had the Akka delivery system. This was like a more reliable way of doing push base of reliable delivery in Akka.net. And then the last big thing that we kind of shipped so far this year, this is the last major milestone of the Akka.net 1.5 roadmap, was Akka.net Persistent SQL, which, um, uh, which Gregorius kind of put the finishing touches on it. But Andrew, T011TM, uh, Andrew is the one who really created this. He, that's kind of like how open source is supposed to work. He made a prototype of Akka Persistence on top of LinkedDB for his own internal use at his company, open sourced it, and then we liked it. We liked the numbers. We took it and worked with him to help streamline it so we could basically blow away a lot of the technical debt from the old implementations that had been around since like 2015, 2016. On top of that, some of these other projects during this time, like Akka Discovery and Akka Management, uh, Ishmael Hamad wrote both of those originally, I, I believe. And I think he also even did Akka Coordination as well. So he's been a production user of Akka.net for many years. Um, and he contributed all of these plugins. And again, Gregorius kind of uh, took it, ran with it, uh, and cleaned it all up. And Akka Hosting and Health Check were little things I started Gregorius, once again, professionalized all of that. So I guess Gregorius is kind of like the, the master refiner of all of our APIs <laughs> here. Um, would you? I, I think that seems pretty accurate, right? You're kind of like the, uh, the master distiller who tastes the thing coming out, of the, uh, coming out of the barrel and says, this needs more time, you know? Mm -hmm. yep. so, yeah. So this was a really good collaborative effort between a lot of different contributors. And then finally, in terms of the future-facing stuff that we started working on, uh, if you followed me on Twitter, you've been seeing that I've been doing some work using uh, Quick, which is the new UDP-based protocol that HTTP3 is going to be based on. Um, we're going to be using that to replace the transportation system in Remote in order to take advantage of multiplexing, which is where we're going to get the next really big order of magnitude increase in performance for from there. Uh, then on top of that, uh, you might have seen Gregorius's demo. Where we're using source generators to try to synthesize serializers going forward. That'll help reduce a lot of boilerplate for uh, Akadonet users, but it should also make it easier for us to enforce extend-only design, and it should make the, the whole system more performant. So I want to go back to this graph, because this is the most important lesson uh, from this whole experience so far. When you begin an open source project, you're going to start here. Everything is new and exciting. There's no production users. And the word backwards compatibility is not uttered in a serious context at all in here. 
Uh, everyone's excited and lots of new contributors all want to join up and pitch in if the idea speaks to a need they have or passion they have. But the critical detail is you don't have production users just yet at the stage. In the second stage, when we start getting to basically attracting production users, this is when you begin the informed, uh, basically the uninformed, uh, sorry, the uh, informed pessimism. You start to see the problems occur with your previous assumptions and designs. Oh, this way you coded, you know, the logging system won't work on Xamarin. Oh, um, this way you use the task and parallelism library causes a deadlock in Windows Forms on this version of .NET. And all of those problems start to emerge. Those problems, for the most part, are not the things that attract your initial open source contributors solving those types of problems. It kind of takes a different um, mindset and a different type of developer to be excited about working on, on those sorts of issues there. They're very interesting puzzles, but it's not going to give you the same plaudits that let's say porting a new feature is going to, or maybe a, a writing a new benchmark or designing a new beautiful graphic for the website will, right? It's kind of not necessarily the same level of let's say um emotional return on investment that everything else is so you start to lose some of your contributors down here because the way you start addressing some of these production concerns is you have to start defining boundaries in your project you got to start saying okay we're going to be practicing semantic versioning this means that you can't just willy-nilly introduce breaking behavioral wire or api changes we just don't allow it and you start having processes that enforce that. That's taking away an entire set of creative freedoms that you previously had before. You also start enforcing other standards like baseline performance measurements, or you start enforcing standards around, yeah, you know, we don't have defined coding standards in the Akadonet project. That's something that we should probably do, but we haven't needed it in 10 years, so maybe not. Don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But you start basically reducing the degrees of freedom contributors have, and you're going to lose people at this point. It's not going to be the same free-flowing marketplace of ideas that it was at stage one. The valley of despair, this is like the tree shaking that happens for the open source project. Um, I believe this is where maintainer burnout happens, is always here. And I also believe that this is where you're going to end up, you have to, it, it's basically going to be a put up or shut up sort of decision down here. You now have a lot of production users, you have a lot of bugs, you have a lot of edge cases, a lot of performance issues, deployment problems, and a lot of demands for things like documentation showing up. What are you gonna do in this stage? A lot of open source users who are working, let's say on a, a lot of open source contributors who are working in their spare time on a project just because they enjoy it, aren't gonna be super thrilled at the thought of being told, no, we can't do this new feature right here, right now, because no one who's got release authority wants to review that. They want to spend their time fixing all these critical issues that are up. Or, sorry, we're not going to accept that feature because it conflicts with the goals of the project, that type of thing. That is where you're going to end up kind of losing some of more of those like hobbyist programmers. Um, during the second stage here, the informed pessimism, we lost. There, there was a big battle that raged between the production users and the hobbyists down here. Um, because there are two different competing sort of views of what the project should be, but ultimately only one of those groups of people had skin in the game to live past the valley, to live through the valley of despair. And that's going to be the production users who have a vested interest in seeing the project continue and seeing their problems get addressed. So a lot of the people who are attracted to your project who want to contribute aren't going to be aren't going to make it unless their incentives are aligned with that of the rest of the project. That's what commercial adoption by end users really helps drive. That's why we had contributors like Ishmael and Zetanova and Zibnek who rewrote our sharding system for Akadun at 1.5. All of them use these systems in production and are very invested in making sure that things work properly and efficiently and correctly. And they'll still, you know, you, you basically still have contributors at this stage, but what motivates them is going to be different in the informed optimism versus the informed pessimism. So when you start getting to informed optimism, what happens is that things that used to be hard start getting easier. Um, part of this is experience. The amount of experience I had working on the first version of Aka.net versus working on it now, I'm a totally different software developer from that person, even though you know, I, I, it's still me and I still have the same goals and desires that I did before. 
But on top of that, your automation gets better. So for instance, we ended up building tools like Incrementalist and Endbench and others to kind of help make it easier to manage really big builds of Aka.net and to performance test things and so forth. But then the other interesting thing that happens after you push through that valley of despair is that the knowledge about how Aka.net or any other tool like it is supposed to work gets more distributed amongst a larger number of people and therefore, the original maintainers of the project aren't as big of a bottleneck anymore for a lot of things. Sure, you might still need them to approve releases and, to, and basically to do a little bit of like project management uh, around stuff. But there's a lot of developers who understand how the remoting system works now, how the persistence system works. They understand how serialization works in Akka.net. And you'll see in like the contributors room in Discord, a lot of conversations about those things happening. That was not so much the case when those constructs were originally being built back in like 2015, 16, um, there was a much smaller population of people who knew about it. On top of that, a lot of Petabridge's paid courses for things like design patterns, remoting and clustering were the only game in town to kind of learn how to use a lot of those tools originally. And that was by design. We decided we needed some way to fund the company in 2015 and those webinars was gonna be it. Well, we discontinued those webinars this year because our sales numbers around selling seats have been going trending down steadily over time. And that's because there's a lot more third-party knowledge out there in the form of, let's say, blog posts, portal site courses, or even just developers you know, talking to each other at work on how all that tooling works now. So those hard problems, those difficult challenges get easier. And then finally, you get to the, this is, Akadana is still in the informed optimism stage. The success and fulfillment stage is basically where competency, not just knowledge, but the ability to execute on that knowledge uh, correctly, consistently over a long period of time and across a diverse range of issues is now embedded across many users and contributors. Um, this is where you know really big projects like ASP.NET are, are, for instance. Hard things can now become routine things. There's a big enough corpus of users that many different people all might be able to spot hard problems and help direct, let's say, the project to solutions towards them. So there's a lot of different things that kind of happen through this growth curve here. And the real trick to basically being able to live long enough to have a 10-year anniversary is what do you do when you get to the valley of despair? You can quit or you can push through it. So here's, in putting this in more literal terms, here's what I think it takes to escape the valley of despair. I've written a lot on my personal blog about uh, commercial open source and the alignment between producers and consumers of open source software. That is still your bedrock for being able to make it through this. Uh, I think Avalonia UI has published a blog post about this today, which I haven't had a chance to finish reading. But you basically need to make sure that, hey, every time you get a, you know, every time you help support a user who filed a ticket, and you have no idea if this user belongs to a paying customer or not usually on GitHub, but you need to make sure it's like, if I help this user solve this problem, I should eventually be able to see some monetary return from that some way, somehow, whether it's just something as simple as making sure bugs that might scare users off get fixed, or maybe this give the, gives the user the confidence to go ahead and ask for a support plan from their company. You want to make sure that there's that alignment of incentives between both groups. And that's going to create a positive feedback loop that will sustain the project over a long period of time. Uh, this requires a lot of intentionality on the business side of things. And this is still like my number one business problem that most of my energy goes into is always trying to make sure that we are uh, keeping these incentives aligned and trying to find better and more efficient ways of doing it. Next is always be improving. So there's a number of different ways you can go about doing this, but the idea is that you need to invest not just in your code that you're shipping, but the way you produce that code is something you need to invest in. So that means better automation and better tooling, uh, having better standards and processes. So for instance, one of the things I did to escape the trough here is in late 2021, we documented all of our standards around how we do wire, API, and uh, I think behavior versioning how we basically maintain compatibility backwards. Cause that's kind of like the number one tax you have to pay to, to support production users is you have to be able to guarantee this new version of the software will not blow up your current application. And here's how we know we've done that. And here's the, the process we followed to help ensure that. 
or if we do know that there's going to be breaking changes, here is how you can opt into those or opt out of them, depending on how you want to deliver that. And here's the upgrade steps to help make this less risky. And by the way, here's a video of us doing it. We had to do that for like cluster sharding and the logging system and Akadot Persistence SQL this year for Akadot at 1.5. And that's where planning before you code is a really important feature. This is, I find, um, honestly, it's the simplest but most important thing you can do when your software gets complex enough in terms of the way it's consumed, the versions that are out there, and the array of different environments it can be in. Trying to just sling code from the seat of your chair for doing, let's say, fairly big you know, feature or performance work, that is going to get you in trouble every time. And the reason is that the number of variables and the number of things you don't know you don't know are so big that you need to have some sort of process to help discover them that's cheap before you get into it and planning before you code will do that um, planning before you code and socializing it with other people uh, in the user community creative destruction um i'm kind of stealing this from the Koch brothers book the science of success they say that creative destruction is like the most important thing for sustaining, you know, the longevity of a business. Um, that also applies to technology and things like open source projects. We'll touch on that more in a moment. Make training docs and samples a priority. An open source project is bigger than the sum of its features. It's also got to be about the things that help users discover which features to use, how to use them properly, and when not to use them. Um, so these are things that we know, you know, are, are constantly a thing we can improve on. So you know, I'll talk a bit about that a little bit later as well. Uh, like I said, Wisdom of the Crowds actually does work here. Uh, one of the most successful things we started doing, I guess, uh, late 2021, early 2022, was bringing the Akadonic community stand-up back, which we're all watching right now, but also including that show and tell presentation, hearing about production users and what does and doesn't work well. Uh, we just had two really good ones over the past couple of months, one from uh, NRK and the other one from Christopher. And you get a chance to learn what were some of the problems they ran into using Akka.net and how do they solve them. Um, that type of information is really valuable for end users. And so another thing we should probably do a little bit more of is trying to uh, help get some, um, help do, draw attention to third-party blog posts and tutorials written by someone other than me or Petabridge. Uh, that'd be another thing we could probably do to even accelerate this even more. And finally, talk to your users often. Uh, you need to learn what their problems are, why they have them. And that will, and like negative feedback is the only type that's actionable. If people tell you everything's great, I love you. you there's not really a lot for you to do with that, even though it does feel very validating to hear. And if you do love us, definitely tell us. We, we, we could use all the warm fuzzies we can get. But when users talk about what's not working well, that is where we find problems that need fixing. So let's talk a little bit about always be improving real quick. So this idea is like, you need to be sharpening the saw, continually reinvesting in your tooling, your standards and your approaches for how you deliver the project. This is the only way you can keep up with all of the competing demands from all the different constituents of users you support in your open source project. So performance is one area where it's really easy to kind of show the benefit over time. Um, I gave a talk about NBench a number of years ago at .NET Fringe, where I talked about how there was an Akadat remote performance regression that came up in a very early version. Um, and everyone was trying to create their own benchmarks to measure that particular problem. And as a result, it was like dogs chasing their own tails over and over again. No one had any idea what anyone else meant by their benchmark. So the first thing we had to do was standardize. Design a benchmark, leave it alone after it goes in there and don't change it. Try to make that benchmark a thing that is held constant over many versions of the software. That'll make it more effective in establishing how much better or worse is this version of the software than this one. Uh, next, we started running and capturing results repeatedly. We actually basically used NBench to go ahead and automatically run benchmark runs every single time a PR went through. And we even had assertions in there where if this performance value dropped below this expected result, we would actually fail the PR when that happened. Now that started causing some other problems, namely that that res resulted in a fair amount of non-determinism. Whoops. Um, but uh, that was still a good approach for trying to establish a defensive means of preserving performance. And then finally, we also did things like updated our pull request templates to require before and after numbers uh, on, on pull requests that affected performance sensitive features. 
And, you know, the next thing we've been working on, which Gregorius, you've spent like six weeks now working on a prototype for this, doing mm -hmm. automatic nightly benchmark collection with the ability to store performance measures in a database over time. So we can have like a scatter distribution of we know that remote ping pong, our primary benchmark for measuring remoting performance, we know that it had these numbers, you know, two you know, two nights ago, and now that has these numbers, and that's more than one standard deviation than, than what we would normally expect, which means either someone did something great or something terrible, depending on what we're measuring, right? So, yeah, always be improving. And you can see the results as a result of this. So I ran all these versions of Aka.net on .NET 8. So that means I've kind of normalized away things like how much faster .NET is from you know, .NET Core 3.1 or whatever. Um, so I went ahead and you know benchmarked Aka.net 1.30, which is running at which is running at about 64,000 messages a second. And then I bumped it up to Aka.net 1.318. This is the last uh, version of Aka.net 1.3 we shipped. We're actually doing 53,000 messages a second. One of the things that we noticed back in the day when we we're working on this was non-determinism in these benchmarks. There could be very big swings in the standard deviation on here. Uh, and that's exactly what we're observing there. So now we take a look at Akadonet 1.415, which came out about a year after 1.318. And it's doing, you know, 5x as many messages as we were before. Um, I couldn't run 1.40 or any of the other earlier versions of remote ping pong because the benchmark actually hung. Um, and I realized that I think we fixed the bug that was causing that in 1.415. So this is the earliest back I could go. Um, but one of the things we added to kind of improve performance here was we introduced IO batching, which meant that uh, we didn't call flush every single time we wanted to write a message over the network. This meant the number of system calls went down pretty dramatically. And this gave us a not only a much faster benchmark measure, but it also made the numbers much more consistent, where rather than having all this variance coming from operating systems sort of scheduling overhead, now the variance was tied to how quickly we could push bits through the socket, which meant that um, we went from having a partly compute bound problem to now having a purely IO bound problem, which is good. In Akadonet 1.431, the performance shot up even more. This is where all those numbers showed up uh, in our graph and we're in the peak of despair. Uh, the bulk of Akadonet's performance improvements came from this period right here. So the final version of Akadonet 1.4, this, this, I think we shipped this in 2023. Uh, so we're at 467,000 messages per second, which is yeah, like seven and a half times faster than where we began in the beginning of this graph. And in Akadonet 1.5, we're a little bit faster. But like I mentioned in our 2022 end of year review blog post on the Petterbridge blog, all of the little mechanical improvements we made in here, which th that's what these were, mechanical improvements, um, we kind of basically hit diminishing returns on that by the time we wrapped up the Akadonet 1.4 development cycle. And in order for us to move forward and discover even more performance improvements to get this from like, I think the max speed you can get with a single Akadot remote connection today, like on this machine, this is an older machine from 2017. I ran these numbers on. On my machine I'm do using right now, I could probably get 700,000 or so. That's probably about the max perf you're going to get with this architecture. We're going to need to employ some creative destruction and use a different architecture for networking in order to try to overcome some of those performance challenges. Now, I wanted to illustrate creative destruction with the .NET ecosystem itself first, because this is something we had to react to in the Aka.NET project. Back in, you know, when we first started Aka.NET, the state of the art was .NET Framework 4.5. That's, I think, the version where async and await were first introduced. If you wanted to do cross-platform development, that was going to be done on Mono. Uh, Mono is not nearly as polished as .NET Core is. I still remember one of my I'm going to include at the very end of the presentation today my five favorite bugs we've ever had to fix. Uh, one of the ones I thought about including on there is the fact that on many versions of Mono and on many different versions of Linux it ran on, IPv6 didn't work properly. That was that was really fun, finding that one out. Um, the state of the art for how most .NET applications were deployed during this time. Uh, Windows Azure, I, bear in mind I was an Azure evangelist in 2012 and I tried using it at Marked Up multiple times. I had $100,000 in free Azure credits I couldn't use because the platform was that terrible, even in 2014. It wasn't really until 2015, 16, 
that arm, which is kind of the the you know the, the modern model that we have for doing infrastructure as a service on Azure. Arm was basically not really ready to go in like a production context really until closer to like end of 2015. Um, so the only cloud options that were kind of out there was Amazon Web Services. And there's there were people doing it. Like we used it and marked up, but not that many. It was mostly on-prem Windows Server. And then the way most people program a .NET was all through Visual Studio with an MSDN subscription. Well, after .NET Core shipped in the middle of 2017, the landscape changed completely. And this is creative destruction. Microsoft decided to take the risk of decoupling their runtime from their operating system and potentially from their build chain as well. Now we have .NET 8 is sort of the state of the art today. Uh, and .NET 8, I'd say most of the server side applications are all basically built with the intention of running it on Linux rather than on Windows. That is certainly a heuristic I would argue is true based on my own direct experience with uh, hundreds of production users there. Uh, Docker is probably the most popular distribution mechanism for most of these applications. If they're not using something like Azure Functions or maybe App Service to deploy, Kubernetes is pretty ubiquitous as well. And on top of that, the IDE ecosystem is completely different. Microsoft took the risk of creating a free cross-platform JavaScript-powered version of their classic IDE, VS Code. And now uh, JetBrains Writer is also a pretty dominant force to be reckoned with as well in this ecosystem. So these are examples here of how Microsoft itself had to employ creative destruction on something as big and daunting as the .NET runtime itself. We have practiced creative destruct destruction a bit over Aka.net, but where we have really accelerated that has been in the past year. So, you know, the Aka.net remote transport layer, that's one example. We've, yeah, you know, I, I rewrote uh, the networking layer once myself. Uh, then we threw out the stuff that I wrote and replaced it with something that Microsoft wrote. And we're going to end up doing that again with a system.net quick a library. In 2021, we got rid of our old DI implementation and replaced it with Aka.dependency injection. This all ties in with the Microsoft.extensions.di ecosystem. Uh, we didn't get rid of Hokan, but we certainly have de-emphasized it and have instead put Aka.hosting on top of it. So, you know, this is going to be a major change that gets reflected in our training literature going forward, where we're probably not going to teach Hokon for the vast majority of the course. Hokon will be a thing where if you've got to configure something special, then you can learn how to do it. Otherwise, if it's one of the, part of the 20% of Aka.net that 80% of people need to configure, there's going to be a C-sharp or an F-sharp API for doing that. Aka.persistence.sql.common. Uh, I can't begin to tell you the number of frustrating errors I've had to debug working on these SQL plugins over the years. We decided that the technical debt from some of those old designs was so severe that it was worth blowing it away and replacing it with a, with a new implementation here. Uh, Gregorius, one of the other projects he undertook as part of Akadon at 1.5, was rewriting the entire test kit to you be asynchronous under the covers. So before we had some async methods that called that were like async over sync. Now we flipped it the other way around. The test kit is natively asynchronous and all the old synchronous methods are still supported, but they're doing sync over async now. We've also redone the entire documentation website twice. Um, once when Akadon at 1.4 shipped, once again, maybe I think two, a couple of years ago, and we're planning on doing it a third time as well. And we have some more creative destruction planned. So for instance, in Akadon at 1.6, we're going to rewrite, basically Akadon remote's getting completely rewritten. That's the biggest thing that's going to happen there. We're also probably going to rewrite the entire serialization system. Now, bear in mind, I'm going to put a big asterisk next to this. We can't throw away the old serialization system because people have like years with Avocadot persistence data that's been written using it. So don't worry. We're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater there. We're just going to introduce a new one that basically can work alongside the old one. That's how that's going to get delivered. So no panic about that. We're also going to need to start supporting new things the .NET platform can support, such as AOT which means rewriting things like the receive actor, which uses um, these expression compiler internally, and that's not compatible with AOT. And then finally, in Aka.net 2.0, uh, we're going to be introducing typed actor references, which is going to be a change so massive that things like Aka.net Bootcamp won't even look the same in that platform. So the purpose of creative destruction here is this, is that at a certain point, things that worked previously stop working. 
as a result of hitting some natural limit or some new competition in the ecosystem or whatever. And you've got to be willing to take some risks on that. But those risks have to be done in a smart fashion that makes it so the end users are going to, to get along and get in the car for the ride with you. If you're just going to do it shooting from the hip without really socializing those changes, without thinking through how does the user actually introduce this into a production system, and without being willing to go ahead and, let's say, be told that your baby is ugly, which will happen to some extent, you're going to have a bad time. But creative destruction is still ultimately necessary to basically make the project a success. Making training and samples a priority. On Monday, I just ran for some of our Akadonet support customers, Akadonet end-to-end. This is my first brand new course I've designed since 2015. It basically replaces our design patterns training is what it really does. Talks about how to do CQRS and how to do domain-driven design and a whole bunch of other stuff with Akadonet. We might make that more widely available, but we've been, we piloted it with, on um, Monday this week with just some support customers. By the way, if you want to make a pitch to your company for buying support, that's one of the things you should do because we're going to start doing more private trainings and webinars specifically aimed at people who have support plans going forward. Um, we're also planning on offering more self-paced free courses through Pettibridge's website. So one of the big things I want to do is expand and update Akadon at Bootcamp. We're going to get rid of the WinForm samples. Okay, guys, that's going away. <laughs> we're going to modernize all that stuff. And we're also going to go ahead and include the other things that should be there, like unit testing, Aka Streams, Aka Remote, and probably a little bit of Akadon Persistence and Cluster as well. Um, we're also going to have an, uh, on our website more courses aimed at operations and architecture. So not just how do you work with the tools and the syntax, but also how to do things like continuous deployment or how to do observability or how to do health monitoring, all that sort of stuff. Um, we're also going to be rewriting the main Akadonet docs. I talked about this, I think, in our May or June community standup. But basically, we've got a lot of swinglish from like the original Akka documentation, like Scala Akka, that we copied back in 2015 that's never been updated. Uh, we're going to rewrite that to make it less academic, more approachable. Uh, we're also going to go ahead and make all the samples runnable. Uh, that's what one of the things I'd like to do. I've been playing with tools like Replit and Data Interactive to try to see if we can do that. Um, I don't know how feasible this is, but we're certainly going to try. And this is all basically designed to help make it so we can keep growing the ecosystem, make it easy for people to inherit Akadonet code bases at work. That's a new problem that shows up now that Akadonet is a mature technology. And this is all, I think, part of the, you know, what's, what's good for the goose here. Finally, talking to customers is the last important tool you need to escape the valley of despair. Um, the most successful mediums we've had for doing this are the community standups with their show and tell presentations and the Akadana Discord. Moving from like one chat platform like Gitter to Discord may not seem like a big deal, but what it really did was kind of open it up so people who are in the Akadana space can talk about not just I need help with Akka.net, but they can also talk about, hey, have you guys ever worked with Timescale DB? I'm going to throw a shout out to Houston, who's in chat here, who has brought that up before. Or, hey, have you guys ever thought about using, you know, Akadot persistence and stream refs to go ahead and do distributed CQRS or whatever? Uh, the Discord has been a really big hit for that. But I also use uh, in person conferences quite a bit as a way of kind of sourcing feedback from end users. Um, being told, hey, we've been working with Akadonet for four years, but we have always wanted this ability to manage clusters this way. We've always wanted a proper, you know, a uh, Cosmos DB plugin for Akadot Persistence or whatever it is you're going to tell me. All those interactions are really helpful. Um, it's also really useful seeing people blog about their experiences and file stack overflow tickets as well. All of that all kind of feeds back into the system we use for keeping track of what people are and are not happy with. You should always be talking to users and always get feedback, especially if it's negative. The most negative feedback is ultimately going to be what helps you. And so that's kind of the, the big pitch and sort of like how the project's evolved and what it's kind of taken uh, to get, kind of keep the project going over these years. I want to kind of end on a little bit of a sillier note for my own gratification here. We're just talking about my favorite Akka.net bugs, the weirdest bugs that we've ever had to deal with and how much I hated them at the time. So the first one I'm going to talk about, this is dating back to Akka.net 1.1, uh, which is this little issue here. As you can see, I had to touch 47 files here, pretty big by our standards. 
Well, if I go and pull out the presentation here, the problem was, was that we were a little too fast and loose during the Akadon at 1.0 implementation with where system messages got sent. System messages have to be processed ahead of user-defined ones. And because they were being sent via actorf.tel, these system messages were ending up in the completely wrong part of the mailbox, which basically meant that functionality like death watch and actor supervision didn't work when the system got busy. Uh, that's a bit of a problem, to say the least. So what did we have to do to go and fix this? Well, this was my first and only time I've ever had to write a Roslyn analyzer for the explicit purpose of being able to exhaustively find every single area where this mistake happened and fix it. And so I used a Roslyn analyzer to do it. I was able to go and patch all the areas, send it through the appropriate channel, which is called send system message instead. And we shipped that fix in Akadonet 1.1. So got to learn a lot about how to work with Roslyn in order to solve that bug. That Because that's what it took to track down all the inappropriate calls. Part of the reason being, you couldn't easily inspect the messages being sent through actorf.tel and figure out if they implemented this interface or not. That required a compiler to do some static analysis. A couple of my other favorites, uh, task and parallelism library bugs. The Akadot remote UI cause, uh, Akadot remote uh, causes UI apps, apps to crash. If we take a look at this user's reproduction right here, uh, you can see that they have this button click event where they're using a remote actor selection and they are going to ask the actor for a message and they're gonna to try to show a message box once this is done. I believe this is Windows Forms is what they're using here. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was that task continuations by default run on the same context where a waiting occurred. This would mean that Akadot Remote could potentially grab the um, synchronization context that the original ask occurred on and would basically end up using the UI thread to, co to basically complete IO operations on the back end. Um, and because the IO operation was depend, basically the IO operation was kind of upstream from, uh, let's say, this ask operation right here, it basically meant you get into a deadlock situation because there's only one UI thread that can service it. Whoops. So what we had to do to fix this bug was specify that all continuations on the task and parallelism library had to be run asynchronously. This was a flag that we got added to the TPL and like .NET Framework 4.61. Um, when we were still supporting .NET Framework 4.5 when this happened, it meant that every time we used a task completion source, we had to actually wrap it inside an outer task and then execute it that way in order to basically use a different synchronization context than the callers because that uh, run um, continuations asynchronously setting didn't exist at the time. That one was very weird and very puzzling. We still have a reproduction for it inside our test suite to this day. Another, another fun UI one, but this time only when working on cross-platform UI applications. ActorSystem.create hangs Xamarin applications. Hmm, so what's going on with this? Well, with this particular bug, and this user wrote a fair amount of detail here, the fundamental problem, as it turned out, was that the ask operation, again, the task and parallelism library here, um, we used, when an actor system started up, a, a task.result call to basically make sure that the logging system had started before we allowed users to begin scheduling actors and doing all sorts of other stuff. Well, the problem there was that that task.result was being invoked on the UI thread, which would cause the rest of the Xamarin app to basically not finish initializing. Um, and there was no easy way around that other than what we chose which was basically make it so we're just going to trust that the logging system starts asynchronously and without awaiting it. And in the event that there was a problem with it, we can basically go ahead and tell the actor system to either shut itself down or just ignore it. And I think we ended up opting to ignore it behind the scenes. But this is one of those cases where like the way these different little Android applications and, and uh, iOS applications started up was very different than the desktop apps and the Windows-based apps we've been working with. And these sort of like async side effects from using um, the task and parallelism library were not things that we had originally thought would be different on all these platforms. But, you know, that's what you learn when you start getting production users. My next favorite, this per issue was my personal white whale for like the entire year of 2022. 
which was .NET 6 performance regression. Now, .NET 6 was heralded as a massive improvement in performance, even over .NET 5. And it was the first sort of long-term release of .NET after .NET Core and .NET Framework kind of merged into one product. And I'm not going to link to the issue because I have the key graph right here. But here's the problem that we ran into, which is using our remote ping pong benchmark, we would notice consistently a massive drop on the order of like 100,000 messages when we got to the later rounds of the benchmark and people could see these types of slowdowns occurring in their applications as well, running on .NET 6. So when I would talk about this on Twitter and try to draw issue, uh, attention to it, uh, I would get told, and I'm going to make a very important distinction here, I'd get told by members of the .NET community, Aka.NET must be doing something wrong, we must, we must be doing something sketchy, and like this is your fault, blah, blah, blah. Members of the actual .NET team were able to reproduce this issue and were much more responsive to trying to actually find and fix it than members of the .NET community were. So Microsoft good, everyone else bad in this case, in terms of the feedback we got. Well, as it turns out, I got to extend the middle finger to everybody else in the .NET community because we were absolutely right. There was in fact a major performance regression in .NET 6 and the Cosmos DB team was the one who finally found it. The problem was, was that thread.spin weight, they changed the structure of the thread pool in .NET 6 from using the natively controlled Windows threads in C++ to using the managed ones in C Sharp. And what happened was, was in that managed implementation, thread.spin weight, which is what you use to kind of temporarily like suspend a thread without putting it to sleep. Thread.spin weight's spin weight value would grow monotonically over time which would basically result <clears throat> in the system gradually slowing down after enough spin weights had been called. So <clears throat> this got this created the latency effect that we observed, and this problem got resolved in the .NET Runtime 6.06 .06 update, and it's never been a problem since. So this was sort of my second worst bug. The worst one I've ever dealt with was this guy. Cluster nodes stuck in joining phase forever. <clears throat> so with this particular issue, the problem was, and here's what made it very frustrating. We had a fairly large <clears throat> number of tests covering Akadot cluster and could never reproduce it in them very easily. Because this problem, as we discovered later, the size of the cluster was actually an important factor here. On clusters with 25 or more nodes, it was possible to get nodes that would be marked as up, like you would see that appear in the logs, but the gossip and the status of the node would stay in the joining phase indefinitely. This meant that your cluster was basically dead on arrival and couldn't work. The other important factor here was that this only happened when all the nodes started up at roughly the same time. So like on Kubernetes environments, if you're going and rolling out a cluster for the very first time, the cluster would hang when this would occur. It turns out the problem was caused by how we used the mutable sorted set in the, in the system.clusters.immutable base class library. If I take a look at the issue here, and let's let me scroll down to the relevant code. I personally spent about, I think I was awake for two days debugging this issue, like 48 hours. It was very, very intensely stressful. Um, let me get to the issue. Yeah, here we go. All right. This is the problem right here. And this is a port of the equivalent Scala code. We have our new members. And our new members takes the change members. This is the left-hand side of the operation. These are all the members whose statuses have changed. And then we have the local collection of members. And then we have the unreachable members. So here's what we assumed. We assumed that we would call union here. It would go ahead and copy the members that were in here into the members that were here. And then that would pump that collection into here. And that's basically how the Scala uh, basically sort of merge union operation works. So this code is a direct port of the original Scala code. What I came to discover is that there is an important performance optimization in this code that can flip the direction of the merge around such that it can actually go from right to left depending on which side is bigger. And this would only get exacerbated when the left-hand side was significantly larger than the right one it would go ahead and basically flip the directionality around. And rather than copying the left into the right, the right would be copied into the left. And so those old members whose values we're trying to replace would never get updated as a result. 
you wouldn't hit this optimization on small clusters where the directions are different. So the, the solution here was that we were honestly kind of abusing the set mechanics, and so is the Scala code, in my opinion. So we rewrote this to use a custom merge function, and that completely fixed the problem. One final honorable mention I want to include here from the Akadon at 1.1 days is re-entrant async actors. Um, this is a feature that we introduced in Akadon at 1.0. And I think as we started de dealing with lots and lots and lots of bug reports and failed unit tests and all that sort of stuff with this, the quote, I didn't come up with it, but someone else did. All of the intellectual overhead of actors with all the complexity of shared state concurrency. In other words, the worst of both worlds. <clears throat> uh, this is a feature that got introduced in Akadonet 1.0 and got released. Let's see, which version of Akadonet was this? Got removed in Akadonet 1.02, less than four months later. Um, that feature did not last very long. But if you want to experience it in all of its glory, Orlean still has this feature in all of its problems. So go nuts. Um, Reentrant actors is not a particularly fun or easy thing to reason about. Don't recommend it. Don't do it. Now, the last thing I kind of wanted to close with today is a big thank you to all of our contributors, past and current, and all of our end users for all of the bug reports, the reproductions, the code contributions, the documentation improvements, the blog posts, the meetup and conference talks, the show and tell presentations, recommending us to colleagues, and also lastly, for, for just trusting us with your code too. Um, it's been a real pleasure and an honor to uh, serve the Akadana community these past 10 years. It's been uh, my sort of golden golden years of my career has been spent working on this. And, you know, in 10 more years, who knows, we might be all replaced by artificial intelligence by then. Um, but I continue to look for, I, I always look forward to doing more work on the Akadana project itself and trying to deliver more new and better and faster things to end users. So, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to extend uh, my thanks to you and, and the rest of the Akadonet community and contributors overall. Uh, couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much. And um, I guess, Gregorius, do you have any parting thoughts before we uh, wrap up for today? Uh, thank you, so, uh, Yeah, thank you for everyone, uh, to everyone that um, helps make Akadonet uh, endorse the uh, awesome project that it is. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've, like I said, I enjoy working on it every day. I'm about to sit down and finally get to trying to troubleshoot that issue with uh, potentially having multiple entity actors appearing in the same cluster shard region. So about to finally get to work on that problem. Um, and, you know, I wake up every day excited to work on Aka.net and try to support its users. So thank you very much for your time today, everybody. And uh, have a good holiday season. And we'll see you all next year at our January meetup. Thank you very much.